Hello guys, Pepper Blue here, and today I'll explain to you how my Chris Vector works. There have been many LEGO Gun creators in the last decade, from Jack Street to Snatcher Tech. Uh, while they made so many different LEGO Guns, they all have one thing in common, which is the prevailing slingshot mechanism for shooting bullets. This here is the underlying principle behind all of those LEGO guns that you see on YouTube. Admittedly, this model is super effective for shooting bullets reliably and far distance, but there is one fundamental limitation that cannot be avoided, which is that the rubber bands have their fronts um, permanently pinned to the front of the barrel. You see, when the propellant and the gun are inseparable, then it becomes necessary to manually reload the gun in order to shoot another round. In other words, it becomes then impossible to um, bottom feed the propellant itself up the ammo clip as you would do with the projectile. Modern guns don't have to be manually reloaded by hand uh, because they have something called gunpowder. Uh, by feeding the gunpowder up the ammo clip, uh, the gun can shoot uh, continuously without manual re reload. And as you can notice, the propellant, in a sense the gunpowder, is completely separate from the gun itself. Following this logic, I decided to engineer a LEGO mechanism in which the propellant and the projectile can both be supplied ba by the ammo clip. And this is as simple as that can be. This is the projectile, that the spring is the gunpowder in a sense, and this entire frame is the shell casing. With a slight modification to the barrel, we can demonstrate how this new mechanism would function. So uh, here is the ammunition. As you can see, there are two layers, the bottom layer and the top layer. And here's the barrel, and it also has the bottom layer and the top layer. In this design, we would have a piece that is pushing this ammunition forward. If that's the uh, direction of shooting, then this is the barrel also painting forward, pointing forward. Um, so by pushing it along this way, um, we can see that due to this little tiny piece poking forward, um, this top layer of this ammunition would have to uh, kind of uh, rotate relative to the bottom layer of this ammunition, which will continue to go straight since this uh, front uh, surface is covered whereas the top surface is open and it allows for turning this way. So essentially, it would do a little split, releasing the bullet along the barrel itself, whereas this would uh, kind of with the force being supplied from behind, turn due to this piece poking forward here, and that would be the shell ejection. And as you can see, that is as realistic as a Lego gun can get. By having a little motor behind this contraption uh, that pushes and then retracts this little piece back and forth, we can create a fully automatic Lego gun. And using this design, I created uh, my first LEGO Chris Vector, as you can see in this video. But I didn't like the fact that my Chris Vector was motorized for two reasons. First of all, the motor is really heavy, and it takes lots of space. But that's not really realistic because the Chris Vector is a compact gun, and it's really tiny. And secondly, I thought that since the spring is supplying the force, the motor is actually not necessary, and I thought that therefore it would be possible to engineer a system which does not use a motor and actually does the thing better. So my Chris Vector underwent a major rebuild. Um, so my ver version 1 Chris Vector had the ammo that was like stacked upwards, and also it was vertically oriented. But of course that was also taking lots of space, and it just didn't really uh, seem to work with this design, so I wanted to flip it horizontally. But when you flip it horizontally, it becomes less apparent about like it becomes less apparent how to 
exactly twisted to release the bullet. So uh, what I did next was I went back to the drawing board and I redesigned, I redesigned the, the shell. As you can see, I added this little piece here. Honestly, a tiny difference to the shell. But what that allows is for the diagonal um, um, design of the ammo clip. Because it allows you to kind of stack the ammo like this. And as you can see, there's this tiny piece here which you can use um, to eject the shell by pushing it. And also by stacking this diagonally, the true benefit of this is that, as you can see, there's a tiny space here which you can use to push upwards as well. In other words, the next task becomes really difficult. It's not just simply pushing this thing along a path, which has like this twisting kind of thing attached to it. Rather, it becomes a task of pushing this thing upwards while keeping this steady, and then a millisecond after to push this out to eject the shell and allow the next one to go to the chamber. So how I achieved that is here. Um, this piece here, that releases the bullet. Let me show it to you here. That piece here goes under that and then pushes upwards, as you can see. Now, the ejecting part, the second part, which is also really tricky, was done using this red piece behind. As you can see, there's that red piece which twists. And when this black piece, the L shape, goes in, the ch um, goes in front of it, that twisting motion allows the shell to eject outwards. And this entire mechanism is designed such that uh, this elevating part triggers before the ejecting part. So I'll explain how all of this is timed precisely um, using just one single hammer. So how it exactly works is we have this sliding piece here which is linked to this, um, this part which elevates the ammo. And that's done using, I um, can't really show it here, but there's this L-shaped piece, which is linked to this piece here. And as this retracts, you can't really see it now, but there's actually a piece that sits on top of this, which locks onto this uh, blue piece. So when this goes back, imagine there's like another piece on top that's pulling this along. But right now it's going back along with it just because of gravity. But in reality, there's another piece that's like on top, kind of um, linking them together on the top. So these move together like perfectly. Now, there's this uh, other piece which is responsible for ejecting the shell, which is that red piece behind. You can't really see it well, but if you can see it moving, right? That's the piece that ejects the bullet. And how that works is uh, it's um, it's uh, connected with this piece on top, which is at a 90 degree angle to the bottom one. And as you can see, this uh, hammer, which pushes this, not only does it push that, but it leads to rotation on this 90 degree angle piece, causing a subsequent rotation on the bottom. And you would imagine that I would use a rubber band to um, reset this position to this angle. But actually, no, I don't do that. I actually use another piece here on top, which sits at the same angle as the ejector. And essentially, when the hammer goes backwards, it resets this position as well to that angle. So the only rubber band in this entire contraption in the front compartment of this gun is the hammer itself. Oh, sorry, this hammer here. This is the only piece that is connected with the rubber band. 
and that makes this really elegant. And regarding the timing of this entire execution, there is this sliding part, and, it's, and noticeably, since this L piece will, is well an L piece, the front will touch the, uh, what do you call it, this slider first, and after a few seconds, it'll lead to turning. Uh, therefore, by the time that it has reached like about a, a near horizontal angle, uh, which means that it will have uh, it would have already shot. Um, then it will start turning this piece here, therefore ejecting thereby ejecting the bullet. So, even though this like a uh, hammer goes pretty fast, which is because there's like a rubber band attached to it, like forwards. Um, it still like executes everything in the same correct order. So you have previously seen this entire mechanism with this top two layer open. And you saw the slider and the rotating uh, pin that ejects the bullet. So uh, here it is with the top two layers on and it really adds to the, to the explanation. So first of all, here is an extension to the the shell ejecting mechanism, the axle. And the purpose of this is that when the uh, the knocker, wait, what do you call it, the hammer, the hammer retracts backwards, it resets the position of the, what do you call it, the shell ejecting piece. So let me just show it to you one more time. Here, you can see it moving back and forth here. And the, the second part of this, uh, the top layer, is the front. The front has a little piece here, and that just wraps over this little L piece here, this thing, so that again, when you retract this backwards, it resets the position to the bottom, so that it's ready to um, kind of turn and twist the ammunition again. So here's everything in action, back and forth. And it's just magical how like smoothly everything runs because you can look at like literally look at the tension like this is a regular rubber band and just giving like more than like regular tension allows for this entire contraption to function properly. The obvious next task is to make it so that this hammer is reloaded when you pull the trigger and also fired when you pull the trigger all the way to the end. And that's a pretty monumental task because we're using one button for two purposes, reloading and shooting. And so how do we achieve this? Well, uh, first of all, here's what we have right now. This front mechanism perfectly working. And we have this trigger linked to the top. And I also just added this rubber band in the front. Sorry, here. Just back and forth, you see. So how do we link this together? Well, here's how. Um, we have this little L piece here. This L piece locks to this hammer. So when you pull this back, um, it'll kind of bring this along. And uh, it tries to stick towards this um, hammer because the, ta the tension on the rubber band is directed that way with this axle like pointing it this way. So it's kind of pulling it that way, which makes the L shape not go like that. It just tries to stick to this wall. And as you bring this all the way back, right? At one point, you're going to want it to release, right? Like at one point, you're going to want it to like, go like, kind of like that, so I can shoot. And then you'll have to like bring this back and then it'll repeat the process. So how do I make it release at the end? Well, it's pretty simple. This is an L shape for a reason. I put a little block at the end, kind of like this here, so that when this, um, this thing goes to the desired position at the end, um, this thing will apply a torque that way leading this to lift off from the wall surface here, thereby releasing the, uh, the, 
the hammer f forwards. So here you can see when you pull this trigger, it pulls this top connection of the trigger backwards, which is by default bent towards that surface due to the rubber band, which brings along this hammer backwards. And at one point in the end of the travel, you'll see that this L shape, the, the uh, shorter part of the L, will collide with the wall of the outer surface of the gun which will cause a rotation um, to make it straighten and that will release the connection with the hammer here and yeah that's how it works you may have been wondering why there was this little axle randomly attached to the hammer and that is because we want to control the space like remember the L shape that was um, making the um, the hammer go along with the trigger until it suddenly snaps out, right? Um, that was done using tight space control here. Essentially, there's a wall on, on this surface. And by having this axle, I found out was the best way to control the amount of space um, here so that there's very little friction when the release happens. Like, imagine this does not exist. Then if there was like a, just a wall here, then it would have a pretty hard time popping outwards, like as you can see. But since there is this piece here, the there's like only so far um, towards the surface that the L shape can go. So it makes it easier when it reaches the end of the travel and it has to pop out. So yeah, there you have my explanation of how the gun works. Obviously, we have to touch upon the back, the folding stock. What's noteworthy about the folding stock is that it's compact. And also, this folding surface is completely flat, even though it folds like this. You may be wondering like how it's completely flat on that surface. Well, it's because it has two joints. Another feature of this folding stock is that when it folds, it locks automatically. Here. So let me explain that with a simplified example. Uh, simply, there's this one L-shaped piece and there's this piece which has a protruded end which can lock like this and release like this. Here you can visibly see what I just mentioned. This L-shaped piece here and the hook here. You can see it kind of has a protruded end which can lock onto this little part of this hook. So with that logic, you could probably make uh, a system which locks manually, right? You can simply attach an uh, axle to a switch here, which would kind of open and let go of this thing. Uh, but it becomes really challenging when you decide to make it lock automatically. Well, one obvious solution is to simply put a rubber band to pull this part of the switch downwards, thereby uh, pulling it closed so that it only opens when you uh, pull it upwards. And that could in theory work except for the fact that if you were to do it so that this is constantly closed and you have to pull it down to open it, then what happens is that when you try to close it, you could accidentally break this entire uh, joint in half since, uh, as you can see, it doesn't open like when you are trying to close it unless you are trying to open it like while closing it but then you could forget to do it so then you could break your entire lego piece so essentially what was needed was a system which would apply torque keeping it closed when the stock is closed however the system the same system has to keep this thing with zero torque or keep it open 
when the stock is open. So how can you make it happen? Well, this is the solution that I came up with. I'm not sure you can see it from this angle, but this uh, piece here, um, I connected it with another piece here, which is at a 90 degree angle to this same piece. So by pushing this, you would close it essentially. And uh, on the flip side of this, the actual stock, I put a rubber band system which constantly pushes this. So you can see how this works, right? When you were to close it, then the rubber band force uh, transfers across the stock joint onto this black piece, keeping it closed when it's closed, but keeping it open when it's open, as this does not connect when it's open. As you can see, when it's closed, the rubber band is pushing against the black piece here, which is keeping the stock um, switch closed. But of course I could turn it against the rubber band force, which would open the lock and allow this stock to open. But when it's open, uh, this is just a static piece and there's no like, um, like uh, no torque applied across this axle, which means that this does not have any reason to go back up against gravity, unless this gun is upside down, of course, but assuming that it's up upright correct, then this will stay down, allowing the stock to close uh, as this hook would go over this uh, lock. This part, this little thingy, that is what stops the, what do you call it, the stock catch to prevent moving any further. Another benefit of putting most of the mechanical aspect of the stock into this stock itself is that it saves space from the front of the gun. Uh, si since the gun already has so much complexity on this front portion, uh, it's really good that I put the stock folding mechanism into the back here um, because I was left with very little space in the front here. So here you can see the folding stock in action from the top view. This yellow pusher fits smugly between here and just clicks at the top. Oh, by the way, let me just remind you, it has two joints. It has two joints here, one and two. This is how it um, folds 180 degrees. Um, here. Also, you might want to note that uh, this folding only works when it's rotating upon the first joint. If it's on the second joint like this, and it tries to collapse the st stock, like or straighten the st stock, then it'll hit upon this axle here um, because the radius becomes bigger when it's on the second joint. So it always has to be on the first joint. Um, and how I managed that was by, if you look here, by having a rubber band that's pulling uh, to straighten the second joint, thereby making the first joint the only joint that's bended at most of the time. This uh, T-shaped here, this prevents uh, the second joint from bending any more than it should. And it also um, collapses here, like so. So yeah. When it's folded beyond 90 degrees, however, of course the rubber band's going to stretch. However, the stretching is very like tiny, so like it barely like bends outwards, as you may imagine. Uh, sometimes I feel like the stock is like a little bit fragile, and I don't want to accidentally break this entire gun by snapping it in half. Uh, while I'm carrying it, so what I like to do is like put a axle through the other side, like it bends, um, it bends this way. So I like to put an axle through here to strengthen it in case I want it to be straight, and I don't want to like break it by accident. But uh, another way to do it is by inserting this little piece here. When you're to push it, it just fits smugly into the bottom 
as if it's like part of the gun itself. So yeah, you could of course take it back out by using an axle as a key. And there you can do it again. Uh, here's the ammo clip. It goes in here. This is the bottom pusher which will push the bullets up the ramp. Uh, the purpose of this little yellow piece here is that it, su it supports the back of the first, the bottom most um, ammunition up, up the slope. And the reason for this to be a slab, the half, a half block, is that it allows for the shell ejection to work more smoothly because when it's like um, at the edge, that it's going to fall off. Um, and there is this piece here. The reason that it's like it's this thing rather than that thing, like is because first of all, if this did not exist, then it would kind of slope downwards and it would lead to this thing not being accurate, so it's necessary. Um, but the reason I didn't just simply connect it with the beam like this is because um, <clears throat> there has to be space here such that the lifting can happen. As I explained before, like so that this thing can be lifted upwards the front. <clears throat> so yeah, that's the intricacies of the mag magazine feeder. And of course, the rubber band will be wrapped around this thing, the spinner here, allowing this to uh, constantly go upwards. The scope uses this special piece here, which has a hole, yet allows for connection of these two uh, beams. And it uses this um, kind of piece, I'm not sure what it's called. It goes on the side here. And yeah, you can see through it. And for additional effects, I add this Lego tire with the plastic part taken out. And I use this here, which is a half connector. And by putting it over it on both sides, I can make a pretty good uh, scope, sni sniper scope. And the bottom is connected using this uh, Lego piece, but it's pretty standard, so yeah, you can pretty much figure it out yourself. Now the gun itself also has a pre-mounted scope. For example, this one here has this. So yeah, this is how the front is made. The top is a slab with this um, connector here, which goes like this, and it goes on the front here. Now the back part, this is from Medieval Catapult Kit, I think, which had like some kind of like uh, shooting thingy here, but I got um, the middle part taken out, and now it can act as a scope here. There's a hole which can be used for aiming. Now, immediately in front of it, there's this V shape here. It's just like a decoration, but it's connected using a four block uh, long uh, Lego axle and two dinosaur teeth shapes, and this piece here. So thanks for watching this video to the end. Uh, this is how the mechanism works like super smoothly. And yeah, I feel like we should really see more spring-powered LEGO guns in the future because it's more realistic to the modern standard of having uh, encased shells containing the projectile and the propellant together. Now, um, I know that a lot of you have been requesting like instruction slash tutorial videos on how to construct this gun from scratch but I don't think I'll be releasing that anytime soon because I'm pretty sure that many of my viewers would have a trouble finding this exact spring that's needed for this mechanism to work and the reason is that this spring which has to fit first of all smugly through the axle with the right radius has to also be the right um, 
stiffness because if it's too stiff then it's not going to be good on the Lego and it'll have to require more activation energy to release the bullet. But if it's not stiff enough, of course, it's not going to travel enough distance and maybe not even make it out of the barrel itself. So there's many different specifications that's needed for making this gun. And also, this gun uses uh, special pieces such as this piece here and like some of the pieces that are inside. Uh, it's pretty hard to show it to you, but maybe something like this would be useful. But the point is that like there's many pieces that the viewers could be missing, so if I do release this uh, tutorial, then I'll have to probably produce the entire um, like resources list that's needed for making it. Maybe like sell it as a kit or something. But for now, I don't have the time for making that, so yeah, here it is.